BizTax Technology Show, where we feature tech companies that are innovating and transforming the technology landscape. Now, today's featured company is Anchantro, a B2B SaaS product company that enables seamless e-commerce logistics and multi-channel selling for online sellers, brands, distributors, and third-party logistics providers. Now, our guest today is Vaibhav Dabhade. He's the founder and CEO of Anchantro. Welcome to the show, Vaibhav. Thank you, Varan. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. Now, give us an overview of what you do and your history since you started since 2011. Sure. Uh, yes, we are we're completing 10 years next month, 17 June. A uh, bit of history right, about, about company and about me. So I'm originally from India, uh, near Bombay, born and brought up there. I uh, did my engineering, worked in a couple of early stage, small companies uh, back then. Startup was not a buzzword at that time. Yeah. Uh, and then I moved to Singapore in 2003 to work for a French enterprise software company. I was an uh, early employee, uh, worked there for eight years plus. Uh, eventually, uh, founders decided to sell the company to a private equity. And then I decided to move on and start my own business. I come from a family of uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, okay. My grandfather started logistic business. My father continued doing that. Uh, so kind of even though I did my engineering, uh, there was always an ambition to start something on my own. So 2011 was a time when then I decided to start a company, uh, started with a, with a very simple vision uh, that as the businesses are going to go more and more into digital world, as consumers are going to, going to buy more and more online, I believe that time that the industry would require a completely new set of software and technology tools to build, uh, run and scale their e-commerce side of businesses. So that was the vision of Enchanto in 2011. That's still the same vision that we have today. But uh, funny enough, we went through a massive due to. Uh, we built the first version of a platform, an order management system for e-commerce. Uh, we were slightly ahead of our time that time. I managed to sell that to a couple of early customers, but the software was not very practical. Uh, it was developed in a vacuum. It was developed without a real experience of running e-commerce and logistics on our own. So it ended up becoming a bit of a flop show. Okay. Then we, we, we did a very brave move and we decided saying, hey, look, uh, we need to develop better software. We need to develop much more simple to use and practical software. That's why we decided to run our own logistics operations. We decided to take a, a proper experience of ourselves as, uh, as an online seller. And we did that. So for six years, Anchanta was a services company. Uh -huh. I was running a warehouse in Klana Jaya. I was running a warehouse here in Pasing Pajang in Singapore. Okay. We were picking packing orders for a lot of online sellers. So that's in your blood. So you are a third generation. <laughs> third generation. <laughs> so did a warehouse, did the whole logistics show, did the order deliveries. But while we were doing that, the ambition was always to rebuild our entire platform. And we were doing that. So we actually had software engineers sitting in warehouse and building the next generation practical software for running e-commerce logistics. So fast forward coming to 2017, uh, we had the whole platform ready and we managed to sell that software to 10 logistics companies. Okay. And that was a validation that, hey, look, uh, we have this heritage of, of running logistics on our own, but we are a software company and we are, we are good in building software. So how did, did you split the business then? So we, we split business into two parts. Uh, we yeah. call it horses and donkeys. So <laughs> a services business kept uh, running the lights. Uh, services business kept bringing the cash in the company. And the product business was consuming that to build next product. Right. So some part of the development team was actually working on next product. Some part of the development team was working in supporting customers, uh, running warehousing operations. Right. So. And then we decided in 2017 to uh, sell our logistics business to one of our customers, a okay. company called World Fashion Logistics, uh, Italian logistics company. Um, they were running on our platform and we needed that one event to become again 100% software company. 
So by the time of end of 2017, we became a 100% software company. I sold my entire logistic business to one of my customers. Okay. And then again came back to where we started as a pure enterprise software company. But this time we had much, much better product. We had a lot of experience of running e-commerce and logistics on our own. We, know, we knew exactly what are the pain points. We knew exactly what are the user conditions in which they actually use software in warehouses, in online selling uh, companies. So we pivoted back, right? And today what we are as a company is we are close to now 200 people company mm -hmm. uh, with um, I would say seven years of logistics heritage and four years, three and a half years of uh, of software heritage for us. Um, we are headquartered in Singapore uh, as a company. We have a software development center in India, a uh, city called Pune. We have close to 125 software engineers working on our product, building the next versions and new capabilities into our product. Wow, that's a very significant amount of engineers. So it's 60% uh, of your company is engineers. Yes, in fact, 66% uh, of Enchanto founders are also engineers. Yeah. So we are four out of four. Julian is from finance side, but most of us are engineers. I'm a software engineer. I come from a, a deep engineering background. Uh, today as a company, we have a direct presence in, in, in Malaysia, uh, Kuala Lumpur, Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, Australia. We have a joint venture partner in Korea. And we are in Brussels to set up Enchanto in UK and, and, and France as we speak. So as a company, we are providing a software technologies for e-commerce backend operations. So helping businesses to run their multi-channel selling, managing the catalog, uh, processing orders, uh, running massive warehouses. Uh, typically, a mid to large size logistics companies, they use our platform to run e-commerce logistics services. Okay. Right. We also provide tools to uh, logistics companies to onboard and engage uh, online sellers as their customers. Uh, we have a support center distributed across all locations. Uh, for every country where we operate, there is a local account management and support team that supports our customer. And in process, we raised close to $27 million funding at different stages of Enchanto. That's right. And I'm going to come back to you uh, about that a little later on. Sure. But in order to understand your your how your software is used, could you give us an example of a specific customer and how they are how you are partnering with them to enable them to fulfill their needs. Okay, so maybe I'll give you two, two examples very, very, very clearly uh, that any business can relate, right? So take an example of a brand like uh, L'Oreal. Okay. So L'Oreal sells uh, online on marketplaces. Marketplaces are very, very prevalent here in Southeast Asia. Yeah. And L'Oreal runs official stores, which are operated by L'Oreal, right? Now, to do that, L'Oreal requires an extremely strong backend system to manage their entire data from their backend systems like product, pricing, promotions, uh, and product information like catalog. Okay. To bring back that data and push it to all the sales channels for a consistent user experience. So they need that order management system to bring the entire backend product data and push it to e-commerce channels. And same time, they need that order management system to bring all the sales orders in real time from marketplaces or from their boutique store and push that onto their backend systems or to their logistics partner for picking and packing that order. The entire e-commerce of, of L'Oreal uh, in the region runs on our platform. That's one example from a brand perspective. Right. I will give you a second example from a retailer perspective. So uh, you might be familiar with a, a business in Malaysia called Maidin. Yes. Is a, is a department store. It's a very uh, large retailer, hypermarkets, and then they've got different format stores now as well. Exactly. So Maidin as a company, they have a huge emphasis on e-commerce. They have a huge footfall of people coming into their hyper, hypermarkets and buying products. Same time, Maidin has a strategy to build a digital channels for them. So Maidin selling products on MaidinOnline.com, Maidin selling products on their uh, social commerce channels, Maidin selling products on marketplaces as well. So to, to 
operate all of that, MyDean requires a very enterprise class backend system that includes integration of their all sales channels into a single platform. So they use Unchant the platform to integrate all their digital sales channels, bring all that data into a centralized warehouse and process orders from there. For MyDean, we also provide them a complete catalog management system where MyDean has one centralized team managing all the products, images, graphics, promotions, videos, and then distribute that to all the sales channels where they sell. We also enable for MyDean click and collect, right? Because MyDean has a footfall of uh, people coming to their, mm -hmm. uh, their stores. Uh, we also enable MyDean's uh, processing uh, through their current warehouses. So MyDean of course has a lot of warehouses to run and, and store their goods. Uh, we have deployed our warehouse management system with MyDean there to uh, run a very synchronized and smooth e-commerce logistics operations for MyDean. So that's the second use case from a, from a retailer perspective. And I'll give you third, a very quickly use case from a small logistics entrepreneur perspective. So there is this lady in Malaysia, her name is called Nadra. And she had ambition, she has ambition to build a logistics company for micro SMEs and SMEs. It's a company called Tresco. It's a, it's a Malaysian, a very novel idea, uh, and, and built by these two ladies. Uh, Nadra uh, wants to provide a warehouse to micro entrepreneurs and SMEs so that they can focus on selling, while Nadra can offer under the name Tresco, uh, picking, packing, warehousing, uh, shipping returns management services and luckily the, the Tresco strategy has worked very well and we've been working with Tresco right from the beginning and we enable warehouses of Tresco with our technology so that they can run they can onboard those micro SMEs and SMEs they can run pick back operations for those sailors uh, using our software now by the I'm I, I, I'm interested to ask you how did somebody like her um, afford a software solution like yours? Did you do a special pricing model for some uh, 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 a small entrepreneur like that? Okay, so it's a, it's a tricky question, right? So uh, when we actually start to work with with with, uh, with Tresco on that front, we knew that the company is very ambitious and we knew that the company will be very successful. So we had to be a bit creative in terms of the way we packaged our pricing for them. So okay. that they can keep adding more sellers because the sellers that that Tresco adds also very small sellers. You cannot charge right. a huge price, right? Yeah. But we have to have a faith that it will grow over a period of time. The number of sellers will grow, number of uh, customers will grow, or some of the customers will outpace the rest of the cohort, right? Uh, with that, we worked out on a price that could work for us. Of course, our products are not cheap. We are a premium company. Exactly. Yeah. We focus on mid and large market. But when we work with smaller businesses or startup businesses, we kind of take a risk and we also, it's kind of a blink, right? You know, you see that it will be true and it will be successful and big. Correct. That's where we create a more like a long-term strategy pricing with them. And okay. it has worked so far well for us. Yeah, because, you know, a company like that, um, and, and that's a very interesting approach. That's a very entrepreneurial pricing approach, obviously, because it's at, like you said, they could be very small and 12 months later, they've got these 20 million VC funding and they can afford everything and all they need, then you go back to a normal pricing model for them. Exactly. Now, your market space, the, the, your software market space is has a plethora of competitors. So you've got everything like Aculinks from the US, Leia from Germany, you've got Tectura from India and a host of, of other competitors. What makes you stand out for a competition? I, I think the, the most significant one is the one I told you at the part of Unchanter story. Yes. We are a logistics company building a software for logistics company. I have worked seven years in warehouse. My team has worked seven years in warehouse, going through the entire pain, knowing exactly that how that a, a, a warehouse staff, somebody 56 year old uncle who doesn't speak very fluent English, he probably has a vision issues and he's using a software on handle device in a very low lit area of the warehouse. How do you make sure that, that that particular warehouse users can still use your software practically? And that you cannot do that while sitting in a very nice air conditioning office in the middle of CBD. 
Absolutely. A, a couple of 25 year olds sitting around uh, in a co working, a nice co working space can never figure it out because they're essentially doing it in a vacuum. As you exactly. Point out. As you say, right? You know, never, never trust a skinny chef, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's our biggest advantage. We have that logistics heritage as a company. We know the pain points. We know the, the how does the balance sheet and PL of a logistics company look like. Uh, we know that what percentage of their total spend we should pay. Uh, and we speak the language. We are one of them, right? So that's one. Uh, number two is that every country that we operate in, we have a local team. So if you talk to Anchan in Malaysia, you will hear someone like you speaking there, someone who knows the context, who knows the lingos, who knows the buzzwords, who knows exactly what you mean when you use that particular word. Right. If, you, if you are running a, a, a show from US or, or, or from, from India or for that matter, any other country, and you're trying to support a user in Vietnam, you're going to struggle a lot. Yes. So we want to make sure that everywhere our users use our product, they should not even feel that they're working with a company from Singapore. They should feel that they're working with a company um, from their country, from Vietnam, in their, for that matter, right, example. Uh, so we give a lot of emphasis on localization. And we believe that people love to work with people. It's much more easier for people to work with the people from their country, their cities, location, and language. And we invest heavily on that to make sure there's always a local team. Now, can we zoom out a little bit and, and talk about, from a macro perspective, what are you seeing in terms of key trends and shifts in the markets that are taking place in e-commerce right now? Yes, so if you, if you look at it, right, uh, you need to start from the beginning. Right? In, in, in this part of the world, e-commerce pickup started very early stage with eBay becoming the most dominant. Then there was a phase where Alibaba was the go-to mechanism for for a lot of uh, people to buy products. And then came Rocket Internet in 2012. Yeah. And they started rolling out ventures one after another. Uh, Zolora was one of them. Then there was a Raidmart. Not Raidmart is not Rocket Internet that time. But then Lazada came on board and, and many yeah. more, right? So, and now we have for last 18 months is what we have is, is, is COVID, right? So COVID has basically put the entire e-commerce adoption on steroids. Right. So, and the way we see this, this transition happening is that none of it is going to go back to the normal stage after COVID. All of this adoption of e-commerce is permanent habit changing adoption. Once people are comfortable with this, when, when you're buying your fresh produce um, uh, online, when you're ordering your food online, when you're ordering everything that you need online, right? Uh, those habits are not gonna change. So, that's number one. People are getting used to it. People are adopting and finding everything possible because you don't want to take a risk. You don't want to go to the mall and, and buy uh, an artwork uh, material for your kids during the holidays now. You right. want to do that online, right? Because you, you want to minimize the risk. Um, so first is just, these changes are happening too fast because of COVID, number one. Number two is these changes looks like they will be irreversible. Once we are used to it, we're used to it. We're not going to go back. Yeah. Um, retail has come under a lot of pressure. If you look at the revenue per square feet has dropped, the footfall per square foot has dropped everywhere. Yeah. Even if people are going to the mall today, they're going straight to where exactly they need to go and come out from there. Yeah. In the past, mall was more like leisure. You know, you spend time, you discuss with your friends, you have an ice cream, you watch movie, you take a tea. That all has gone. Now it's go, buy, and come out, right? Uh, while this is happening, the social commerce is getting a lot of a lot of traction, which we never saw like a year back before. Now today we see that more and more people are buying, and we as an Asian, we like to share, we like to discuss as a group, we yes. like to even like you know I remember back from my compound days back in India that when you want to go for a big shopping, you go with few friends or few relatives, right? For that matter, and that that behavior of people that they want to share more. We see a more of a social commerce adoption happening. Baba, where do you see that? Okay, China obviously was really the pioneer in terms of social commerce and streaming and stuff like that. Where do you see that uh, greater adoption in ASEAN? Number one is Indonesia for sure. 
Indonesia as a country, they are the they are very it's, it's a very social interaction driven uh, uh, community or, or the country there, right? People like to share there. Now, if you see Twitter adoption there is much more massive than the rest of the ASEAN countries there. It's all because of sharing. Right? So Indonesia definitely has number one. Number two, we see that the highest adoption of social commerce happening in ASEAN is actually Thailand. Thailand has second highest in terms of growth numbers for us okay. uh, when it comes to social commerce. So definitely social commerce is speaking up very fast. Um, another at the micro level changes, right? We see finally that there's two legacy businesses, logistics and retail. Uh, they are, they've been there for donkey years, right? So they've yes. always needed there. Uh, those businesses are now finally waking up to a concept of e-commerce. They've been hit very bad, unfortunately. Both businesses are a very heavy fixed cost businesses. Logistics, you store air or you store goods, you still have to pay the rent for your warehouse, right? That's right. Same thing for retail store, people come, people don't come, you still have to pay for the rent. So those two businesses, because of COVID, has now changed the plan and they are going so fast in terms of adopting to the e-commerce. And there's a huge fear of missing out for logistics companies. Uh, that they will miss out ultimately to e-commerce boom and they want to make most of it. Now, let's talk numbers a little bit. Um, what sort of revenues are you doing right now? So we generally don't talk about financials as a company, but okay. I will give you some idea right, you know, as you're asking for, and then you can make the mathematics. Um, so today we are a cash flow positive company. Uh, okay. We raised money last year that was for adoption. Um, uh, yeah, and, and you've done a to you've totally raised 27 million, am I correct? That's correct. We raised total 27. Out of that, uh, the last uh, that came for $15 million was laid by uh, Ascendia. Ascendia is a logistics company with a 1.2 billion euro revenue company. Uh, it's a joint venture between Swiss Post and French Post. Okay. Um, one interesting fact here, I'll, I'll come to the numbers, but just to yeah. not to break the link. 90% of the money invested into Enchanto came from Enchanto customers. I, then that's a great testimony to your solutions. Exactly. So and, and and I, was cheap, the team. I was, I was, we call it uh, brave or cheap enough to go to my all customers, key customers and ask them, hey, do you like my software? Yes, of course you like it. Do you want to invest? And uh, many of them said yes. So Ascendia have been Enchanto customer for, for, for six years now, so they invested. Indonesia Telecom, their subsidiary has been Enchanto customer. They invested into us. Um, we then have Lux Asia, one of the largest distribution business for fragrances. They are my customer for the last four years. They invested into Enchanto. So it's been uh, it's been a that way very unique journey that 85, 90% money came from customers. Now coming back to the numbers, right? So we are 200 people company, cash flow positive. Uh, the money that we raise is for the expansion of Enchanto. Uh, and what, what is the expansion? Uh, where are you looking at? You said, you mentioned that you're going to France, uh, I think earlier in the conversation, France and the UK. That's correct. So we uh, we have uh, gone to those markets because our latest shareholder, they, for us, India, uh, France and UK are two very big markets for them. They've been a European company, French company. So of course they are very well known there in France. And the strategy, will that be a partner strategy or direct model? How are you executing? We always go direct. We okay. always go direct right? So except like certain markets like Korea where we have joint venture. So we don't intend to do any joint venture with our shareholders there as of now. We will have our direct presence. We'll go there. But yes, we'll leverage on the brand name. We'll leverage on the partnership. We'll leverage on the existing network of our shareholders. That's why they invested into us. We generally don't share the revenue numbers, but typically we look at the volume of orders that we process, right? So today we process close to 12 million orders a month on our platform. Okay. So we have online sellers. Uh, some of them are, are uh, based upon the model, based upon orders, based on the number of users. Um, in terms of the volume, so we have a close to probably now 150 million online uh, products like SKU, stock keeping units. Are managed in live using our platform, right? And in terms of the revenue, we've been doubling our revenue uh, year on year for the last three years in a row. So we are kind of on that ramp. We are in the in a 
in a mode where we believe that we have figured out our unit economics, we have figured out uh, our bottom line, uh, we have figured out the mechanism to remain profitable and grow as a company. And what's the, the financial strategy then in terms of, is it an IPO, is it a, is it a trade sale? What's the strategy for you from, from that standpoint? So we are open for anything um, at this stage. In fact, if you ask me that, and that's why I give this answer, which is we are open for anything, it, because it forces me not to think about it. <laughs> okay. uh, exit is not, uh, exit is not at the, uh, our mind right now. I believe it takes 10 years to build a company. Um, and Chandu, we are, we are 10 years old, but we had that seven years of heritage of being a logistics company. Right. So if you look at the pure SaaS company, we are just three and a half year old company. Yeah, so your early days of your SaaS journey. Exactly. So we are still have like seven, seven and a half years. Most of our shareholders are are not, uh, not uh, uh, typical institutional VCs that they want to flip money in three years time. Uh, most of our shareholders are corporate VCs and they have a lot of patience and they are supportive. Uh, I don't have exit pressure. Now, final question. Now, you've built this successful business over the last 10 years. What are the key lessons that you've learned in your entrepreneurial journey that you could share with other business leaders and entrepreneurs? Okay, um, so we started to follow this thing at Enchanto. Um, so first, I believe that business is a function of people. Right? You take care of your people, your people will take care of your customers and everything will take care of that. So we are very, very people focused company. Of course, we are ruthless when it comes to communication. We are ruthless when it comes to execution. We call spade a spade, but uh, same time, if uh, we need to Way between heart and, 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 and a brain, we of course give more weightage to heart than a brain, right? So people is number one. We want to work with great people. We work with great people and we hire nice people, uh, expert in their domain. We don't look at the certificates. We don't really uh, look for particular credentials when you hire people. We look for people with the right attitude and potential. That's number one. Number two is what we follow is that put your head down be extremely focused in what you're doing. So never losing a sight of what we want to do. We want to build a global SaaS company out of, out of Southeast Asia. Um, it should not be always that all the SaaS companies are coming from West. Yes. Uh, we can build a SaaS company from this small island, from this very diverse region called ASEAN. Uh, if you look at here, right now, how many SaaS companies from ASEAN has cost a billion dollar valuation? You'll have to think a lot, you can't find it. Uh in fact now you're starting to see quite a number out of india yes india yes for sure now there are there are but few not in Asia. but in southeast asia we are yeah. good in consumer uh, companies here for for b2c companies our ambition is to build a global SaaS company that is really meaningful helping people to solve the problem uh, and not losing the focus of it you know so my there were a lot of times you know when we lost the focus I mean, there was a condition where we were almost forced to lose focus on our mission but people, number one, number two is, is focus on the mission and, and kind of keep your head down and, and do it properly. Now, Baibaf, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much for coming in. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Brian, for your time. Really appreciate that. Thank you. I'm Brian Fernandez, and I've been speaking to Baibaf Dabhade. He's the founder and CEO of Anchanto, the on BizTech technology show. This video will be on our Facebook and LinkedIn sites, as well as our website, www.bistech.asia. Please like and subscribe to our various platforms. Thank you very much for tuning in.